So first of all, we wanted to thank you for taking the time to join us. Welcome. We really appreciate your going here. There has to be 15 different things or 20 different things we can do, so your presence is very important to us. And hopefully, if we don't inform, at the least we'll entertain, right? <laughs> so before I get started, what, what we wanted to cover today was four things. The first one is we wanted to give a brief overview of the session. I'll take you guys through it. My colleagues over here will then go through the challenges of what we're facing. Now, earlier on, we've, had, we've heard several times in today's uh, keynote sessions that now the, the majority of our, of our OpenStack community were now in production. Later on, I'll go through some statistics. So now that we're sort of in the, in the middle to the tail end of the engineering problems of the cloud, the biggest problem that I feel we actually face is a migration of business users into this cloud. Um, there's a, we'll also talk about the solutions. What strategies, tool sets, and services and processes have we seen? So, so uh, as a bit of a background, I, I work for a company called Ericsson, and transformation is something that we do very well from transforming networks, transforming next generation OSS and BSS systems, transforming IT systems, transforming data centers, and hopefully the combination of what we've been doing from the traditional world to the new virtual and cloud world, we can give you a flavor of today. And finally, a forward view. What is it that we together, working as a community, can put our heads together? Now, we've, we've, we're working with different partners and trying to solve this migration beast, this migration challenge. And, and I'll run, give a run through through it. But before I do that, uh, let me start off with some introduction. So my name's Earl Villanueva. I lead a services unit within Ericsson that just does cloud platforms. We're actually in the, in the OpenStack top 20 list right now. Um, to my, to the rightmost, there's a gentleman here by the name of Fred Karras, who's somebody who's done things from not, not just large OpenStack uh, migrations and deployments. He's even done things that he probably shouldn't have told me with spy satellites and whatnot. <laughs> Rodrigo Morales, who, who's the lead of our Cloud Center of Excellence, he's also an excellent, excellent OpenStack architect. So hopefully we'll be able to share with you the examples of the pains that we've gone through, the learnings that we've had. Now, speaking of learnings, I, I thought I'd start off with this funny little picture that it seems that now the more and more that we get into it, the more and more that we get into OpenStack, seems to be, things seem to be getting harder, not easier. Okay, we've deployed OpenStack, now I need to f figure about the lifecycle management, how do I update it? Oh, okay, uh, now, now if I'm deploying a new, a new next generation network, I'm not just talking about uh, deploying a new VEPC, but I'm also figuring about what about my underlying cloud underneath it? Because of course, you can't, you, you, it, the next generation network needs to sit on top of an OpenStack cloud, for example. Now, if we, if we look at the, the data, there's a big debate that I hear time and time again with our clients. Should we go with a public cloud route? Should we go with a private cloud route? Uh, right now, obviously, and we've heard this in the keynote, uh, I think it was Boris who mentioned it earlier, the, right now, in terms of sheer dollar spend, it's the likes of Amazon who, who are kind of opening up the market, the, the, the Azures of the world. But if, if, so if the answer is, should I, go, should I go public, should I go private? Okay, sheer numbers, maybe it's public. But wait a minute, based on a sur survey, 71% of everybody is actually doing a hybrid strategy. So people are, and what we've found is in a lot of our important clients, we, there's one group uh, pursuing an AWS strategy, for example, another group uh, pursuing an, an OpenStack strategy. So 71% of the people are using a hybrid cloud. Okay, it, it gives me, it's that, that's not a good answer, well, that means you have to do both. So then we started to look into the numbers from a market data perspective and say, if I had $100, where should I be spending my $100? So first of all, if I look at it from 2015 to 2020, everybody has a 2020 vision. There's going to be a time spend, spend in, in OpenStack. So what this means to a lot of us is that we're going to see a lot more executive interest, management interest, uh, and we've heard, this, we've heard this from the likes of Volkswagen, at and congratulations to at and on winning the, the Super User Award. We're seeing this trend in proof right now. We've heard it with our own, uh, with our own two years. Now, in terms of growth rate, the spend in private open stack, uh, private clouds such as OpenStack is actually going to outpace that of public cloud. Now, there's a reason why, Accent, uh, why, why AWS, for example, is, is announcing their partnerships with Accenture or, or, or Ericsson. This, this is something that we announced in the Mobile World Congress. Because if you look at the sheer growth rate, 36%, uh, versus 19%, okay, may, maybe what's happening is that the momentum that each of us are building in the community is starting to really pick up. Now, if I go into the numbers even a little deeper, well, let's see where the quality of the growth is at. 
So uh, from, from one of the reports that we've looked at, where they compared, okay, they segmented the, 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 the uh, pu both public and private cloud consumption based on the number of VMs. Just from the, uh, so, it, so it's practically a 50% growth if, uh, look from a 22% benchmark. From 22% to 31% of large private enterprise clouds were, uh, private clouds were on, were on uh, 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 enterprise clouds were on, the, on a private cloud. Of course, OpenStack is one of the, the fastest growing private cloud, uh, private cloud types out there. So if I look at what's happening now, if I look at the growth spurt, and if I look at where the quality of the growth is, large enterprise cloud, I think it, it's an affirmation of what we're doing and what we're hearing and what we're striving to do. Now, we've heard many times the whole pets versus cattle discussion. So a lot of our efforts right now is in engineering the cloud. And, that, and, and too often the problem is, okay, now that I've engineered the cloud, Mr. Business Users, I have a fantastic CI/CD environment. I have a fat, fantastic DevOps capability. Let's start moving on. The first thing there is that how many people are actually ready to move into the cloud? So it's not just how many, how many cl na cloud native applications are actually out there. How much work do you need to do to make something closer to the Tosca type of model? In a pets and cattle uh, paradigm that a lot of us strive towards, it kind of takes, ca takes care of itself. But the reality is if you do a wild migration, thousands die. Now, you might, like I said, you might have the most advanced DevOps capability, but at the end of the day, many business stakeholders will say, okay, you have all this capability, but I, I need a migration window. I need a certain batch schedule. I need a UAT type of test. So more and more it starts to go into good old waterfall sometimes, right? So rather than thinking of it as, a, uh, oh, now that we're in cloud, it's pets and cattle, I can just migrate people over. What Fred Rurig and I started brainstorming last year is that we were saying, hey, we need a better me uh, metaphor to this migration. Then we realized, hey, you know what? In the US, people move an average of 11.4 times in their life. They're, they're more or less going to understand what we mean when we say, if you think about migration into an OpenStack cloud, the best, the best thing that each one of us can, can relate to is when we ourselves move, right? And when you move, you're not just putting your things in boxes and moving it. You're actually moving your whole life. You're moving where your kids go to school. You're, you're moving your mailing address. You have to go and change all your bank accounts, all your credit card statements. So imagine you're just one person and it's moving is a massive change that you have to go through. What more with, with a tenant where I, I have millions of transactions that I need to worry about, hundreds and thousands to millions to tens of millions of customers. Why do I move? What's a TCO for me? What preparation should I do? How do I know that I move everything down to the network settings and my security certificates? How, how do I test? How do I unpack and make sure? And once I'm there, how can I take advantage uh, of my new home or take advantage of all of the features that OpenStack has? So with that, I'd like to pass over the floor to my colleague, Fred, to take us through, through this more. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Earl. And uh, uh, yeah, I, the more I talk to Earl and to Rodrigo and, and other colleagues uh, that uh, have been involved with some of these large migrations uh, in the past and current uh, migrations to the cloud, the more I became convinced that the uh, the sort of the overall metaphor of our move is, is absolutely correct. So uh, as Earl was describing, it's not just your, lot, your, your boxes that you're moving. When you uh, move your house, you're actually moving your life. And the same thing uh, occurs when we're moving uh, OpenStack uh, large application systems, uh, the tenants in the cloud environment. Uh, these are operating businesses. They've got real customers, and it's their business life that you're actually moving. So uh, the, the sort of approach is, uh, for a typical migration, and just to put it in parallel with this, is you know, just as if you were moving, you would basically decide to start looking at what, uh, hey, where do I want to move? I want to be in this school district. Uh, uh, I want this size of house, my family is expanding, those type of things. So there's an entire move sort of strategy and then discovery of, of, of all of uh, your, your needs that has to happen. And then ultimately, hey, my long-term plan is to get into this city, this neighborhood, uh, this cloud, by the way. And then uh, after that, we basically start wanting to do the detailed look, just like the detailed planning, which uh, for the migration itself 
comes down to uh, some things that I'll talk about here in a minute, but in the house analogy, obviously we start inventorying how much furniture do I have uh, and those type of things. Then there's the execution. That's actually the day of the move. And I think if, if there's any point that I'd like to make sure we get across today is it's not just a technology problem any more than a move is simply a truck problem. Um, uh, there's much more to it than that. After we move, we want to make sure, uh, do our, our verification, everything in this operating business, this life is ready to go. And then finally, I'll talk about optimization as well. Okay, one other thing before uh, uh, we start going through the process, I wanted to mention about the, the uh, successful migration approach is really very holistic. Um, and, and it has to incorporate uh, elements of, of people and process. I really liked what one of the speakers said this morning in the keynote addresses about how it's a cultural shift. I mean, those are people and process issues, not just technology issues. And one of the things that I found is extremely important as we approach these things is to get cross-functional participation. And as you'll see, there's a lot of different moving parts as we go through these migrations. It's just not simply the cloud technology and uh, the tenant VMs or workloads. Uh, the second thing is we're looking to do, I think, an unprecedented wave of migrations uh, with this very sizable expansion of clouds, and we hope they're OpenStack clouds in the enterprise environment. Uh, we have to industrialize, harden these processes, one, so they're not susceptible to error, but also so we can improve them. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then finally, there is technology involved. These are large-scale migrations. Anything that can both automate it and make sure that it's foolproof is something that we need to concentrate on. Okay, first, a deep dive down into the, uh, these elements. So uh, on the strategy, the, the first thing that uh, we found is the need to go ahead and work with the enterprise that's starting a large-scale enterprise cloud buildup and even understand what their strategy is for, for rollout. Uh, one thing particularly important, if, if uh, the enterprise time scale can allow and we know we're doing it rapidly, but uh, uh, there's, there's different options, right? You could move your, your, your most uh, big applications first or go for early adopters first. We'd certainly recommend uh, doing that uh, approach if you can, simply because you want an early adopter that uh, is gonna go through, frankly, a, a rigorous discovery exercise. Um, migration strategy with tenants, understanding their business issues, <laughs> where they're gonna be located, what their requirements are vis-a-vis -vis their customers, uh, because these are operating businesses. Uh, and then we have to look at the cloud discovery. We'll talk in a second about uh, uh, how we have some automated tool sets and then more are being developed to do this type of work. Uh, looking at the actual application architectures out uh, in these environments. Because here's an interesting thing we found in the enterprises we worked with, uh, even where applications are currently resident on clouds, they are not 100% cloud ready. They're, they tend to be hybrid 80, 20, 90, 10 uh, on the cloud, but also, for instance, external networking uh, that has to be engineered into these moves as well. So that's a very important uh, uh, a function. And then finally, there is the overall roadmap. How are we going to get you over, uh, Mr. Tenant, you operate, Mr. and Mrs. Tenant, you operating business, because we want to make sure that we get you over, you know, your active, active, passive setups in the right way and, and so forth. So those are considerations that we take into account during this phase. Now, I just mentioned about the discovery process. Uh, the business uh, perspective is clearly understanding exactly where the business uh, uh, is in terms of their operations so that we can now schedule them and move them. But there are some technology tools and ways we go about the rest of the discovery. And for that, I'd like my colleague Rodrigo to talk. 
Thank you, Fred. So as Fred was mentioning earlier, it's not purely a, a technical challenge to migrate a tenant, uh, but the technical part is very important too, right? So uh, other than all the process that you need to do uh, in order to handle all the, the, the tenant requirements, you, you need to make sure that all the, the virtual uh, infrastructure that the tenant has in, in the legacy cloud is going to work in the, the, the new cloud, the destination cloud for the, the, the tenants. So uh, if we look at OpenStack and everything that, that a tenant has for a, a virtual infrastructure, so storage, networking, virtual routers, uh, virtual machines, the sequence that you need to create those virtual machines in the destination cloud, everything needs to be accounted for. So as part of this discovery process that Fred uh, was mentioning, you need to account for all those things because sometimes uh, the legacy cloud is completely different from, from the new cloud. You may be changing the architecture, complete, the architecture completely in the, the, the new cloud and you need to account for all of this. You may be changing the, the networking for a software defined network that is completely different. So as part of the discovery process, you need to go through over all those, those challenges, technical challenges, and make sure that the tenant is going to, to work uh, and perform accordingly in the destination cloud. Great. Thank you. So next step, of course, detailed migration assessments and preparation. Uh, the first thing that I want to stress here is the need for labs. I mean, I think most people in, in uh, agile development, OpenStack work, appreciate the need for high fidelity labs. It's that and more when we get into migration for two reasons. Uh, one, as, as Rodrigo was just saying, the tenants are actually moving, even if they're from a prior edition of an OpenStack cloud, to a new version and maybe a new architecture. Uh, uh, getting that vetted out and certified is incredibly important to do that before the migration rather than we're, we're in the active uh, phase of actually migrating workloads over. And the second reason uh, is we need to have a way of certifying our migration tool. I mean, a migration tool, and we'll talk about that in a minute, Rodrigo will go over some of the technical aspects, is really a big transform function going from <laughs> cloud A to cloud B and making all of the very, very sophisticated adjustments, not just copying workloads and pasting them over, but all of the different interactions that happen between the uh, VM and application and networking in, uh, for the tenant setup in the source cloud to the destination cloud. Uh, there's also what we found in, in moving some very large um, enterprise applications as I mentioned before, no tenant that we've dealt with in some of our large adopters of OpenStack are 100% cloud certified. They're, they've got special requirements. Could be external networking, could be certain storage type of, of, of things, uh, that requirements that need to be uh, incorporated into the new, new cloud, made sure, and because if it's not there when we move them, I can guarantee you from personal experience, the migration team is the one that's at fault. So we wanna make sure that that's taken care of. And then finally, it's really phasing out and understanding what it's going to take to move these, these uh, workloads. We've moved now some large enterprise applications that have uh, storage volumes measuring in the many terabytes, hundreds and hundreds of virtual machines and very large storage. So planning that out, is that gonna be able to be accomplished in one day, five days, those type of things so that we understand what the uh, time impact's gonna be and realize that we're operating in production zones. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, so that's a very important thing as well to take into account how we approach this. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rodrigo and let him talk about two of the technical yes. areas again. <laughs> so again, mentioning the, the, the lab environments, right, uh, to test the, the, the migration process, right? What sometimes uh, we, we saw happening is that the, some of our customers, they, they will start with a, a very early OpenStack deployment they, they struggle a lot trying to make their applications to work in that environment. They spend a lot of time, then they change the architecture, they go with something new, and 
they don't test the migration process in, in a lab that really reproduces the, the legacy cloud and the, the, the future, the new clouds that where, where the, the tenants are migrating. So well, it's, it's key to have a, a, an environment, a lab environment, to actually simulate those situations and, and then uh, run uh, some tests in, in an environment that actually reproduces uh, what you have in production. So it's very hard to build uh, a lab reproducing a legacy cloud, but it, it's, it's needed. And, and also the, the, the new, new cloud deployment, uh, the new cloud where the tenants are migrating to, uh, it, it has to be uh, made available to, to the tenants to certify their, their applications there. Because the architecture may be completely different and they, they have to run their applications there in, in a lab and make sure that, that they're going to work after the migration. Okay, talking about migration engine, right? Uh, there, there is part, uh, as Fred mentioned it earlier, there is part of the, the, the migration process, that there is a, a only processes, but then you, you need some sort of tool to do migration, especially in large, uh, dealing with large tenants, with thousands of virtual machines, with a uh, huge storage uh, space that you need to migrate sometimes to a new storage technology. So this is just a very high level architecture of a, a migration engine where we have the, the, the component that is responsible for scanning the, the legacy cloud. And, and these uh, scanning components should be able to actually log in as a tenant, right? And try to, to find, to discover all the virtual infrastructure that a tenant may have, including all the virtual machines, the networking, everything that is involved uh, uh, for that tenant to work in a legacy cloud. And then later, uh, the migration uh, processing part of the, 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 this engine should be responsible to actually copy things from the legacy to the new cloud. And that is a key process, uh, especially when you're dealing with large amounts of data. Uh, the networking has to support this migration process. If you're parallelizing things, it has to be very well controlled because there must be certain uh, things created in sequence, in the right sequence. You need to first lay down the, the virtual infrastructure with networking, storage, everything, and then you start creating the virtual machines. So there are some solutions, but I don't think we're still very, very mature in that, that space uh, when talking about OpenStack and open source uh, tools to do this, this migration. This is the where all the fun starts, when you actually uh, start this process and it, you look at the virtual machines migrating from one place to another, right? <laughs> and then after that, you certify the migration and make sure that the tenant is in the new cloud. Well, great. And, and I said uh, before, it's really not all a technology problem, but there is actually one of the technology problems. I'm, I'm, uh, I know of, of at least three different independent efforts from three different companies to build these migration engines. Ericsson, by the way, my company being one of them. And I think I'm safe to say no one has, has uh, got it perfected yet. <laughs> We're all on that road to discovery. And part of, the, of, of this session uh, is actually a call to action to, to even see how we can get that more industrialized uh, for the future, because the wave is coming. Now, it's execution. This is moving day. This is the day that the moving van shows up. Uh, as of right now, we don't really have a good way within OpenStack for cloud migrations to do a live migration where we can actually keep the VMs and workloads up. So just like on your moving day, when you move from, uh, say, an apartment to your first house or from one house to another, you probably took the day off and monitored the whole thing. And this is exactly what happens as well in the uh, scenario of, of, of a migration uh, currently. So there is a very sophisticated procedure that has to be built because there's a lot of people involved, a lot of technology involved. And in any enterprise that you're dealing with, uh, uh, the migration team is going to conform to whatever the operational procedures are uh, for working in that IT operational environment because you're usually working in a cloud 
that is actually in production and maybe taking one of 10 tenants that's on that cloud and moving them over while not impacting the other tenants. And then the same is true for the destination cloud. So all of this is happening against a backdrop of, of keeping, uh, not interfering with the operation of other tenants within those clouds. Uh, but for the tenant themselves, there is the freeze, they're taking their time off, and there is a change window usually put into a, a, a thing, into effect. And if other impacts are there as well, uh, we've dealt with scenarios where one tenant was actually coupled to another tenant application feeding data. Obviously, all those cutovers have to happen in, in sequence. And then once we've moved everything over, and this is where the, in, the automated process becomes so, pro, uh, so needed with this uh, engine, uh, the complexity of these clouds and the tenant interactions is, is so great that frankly, while you could theoretically have people do it by script, it would be impractical from an accuracy uh, perspective uh, with, with hundreds or thousands of VMs and it certainly wouldn't be very efficient. And then finally, we obviously use, do a quick look, sort of a, a verification test, but that's followed by our post-move verification and acceptance. And this is a process that literally can go from several days to several weeks as a tenant gets over onto a new cloud, depending on their level of complexity that they uh, will want to run through a rigorous set of tests before accepting the live customer traffic. And then uh, there's usually a, a soak in period of burn in to make sure that, hey, there's just no interaction before we start engaging live customer traffic, uh, internal or external uh, uh, to the enterprise. So that's sort of the, the sequence for the post-move verification acceptance. Uh, as a migration team, that has to be worked very rigorously with the cloud tenants before you get into this process. So it's all understood how you go through and certify the, the end result. Okay, and then finally, there's, there's no uh, uh, end to, to this process without what I call optimization. Once you finish your house move, right, you get everything in, you've sort of unpacked your boxes, but now, okay, I'm going to put the pictures here or there or arrange the furniture this way. I think I like it this way. We all do that, right? The same thing happens as the final sequence of a migration. So first of all, uh, there is a need to redistribute workloads now in the new cloud to get the right level of uh, affinity settings and availability and so forth that the application uh, desires and had in their prior cloud. Uh, there is also, uh, frankly, some hand-holding. There's new services available with each release of OpenStack, and the tenants want to consume that. Some they know about, some they don't. Uh, my, my experience is there's no one better to handhold the tenant through this process than the migration team. So it's really sort of an onboarding and migration team to get them exposed to uh, the new features, the, the, the new uh, areas of the cloud environment that they are now in. And then finally, uh, many of the large tenants we work with are in a cloud network. Uh, they exist in different uh, geographic locations. Uh, uh, you know, have high availability, active, active, passive type setups. And so there's actually the then bringing those online in the proper sequence and getting uh, them restored, I'll say, to the exact level of high availability they were before we went through this migration. So that's the, the overall scenario. I hope you saw the analogy uh, to the house move because uh, I think it's, it's very, very accurate. But I think this is the type of process from start to finish that uh, we propose needs to now be industrialized with appropriate technology backing in order to uh, uh, make uh, our processes harden to the point we can go through the upcoming wave of migrations in the enterprise private cloud environment. Finally, I have to mention about governance. So as you can see from the, the model here that you know, we tend to think in the OpenStack community, you know, about this wonderful software. It is great software, but there's frankly several other 
uh, degrees of freedom here, organizations that are involved. One is the data center infrastructure, and then finally, the cloud tenant. And of course, all of this runs on top of the enterprise uh, sort of cloud governance, who owns the cloud. And we need to basically bring into play coordinated governance and program management across this thing. So no migration story would be complete without saying across the, 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 the entire process, at the very beginning, bring in your, your key stakeholders from the tenants, from the cloud organization, development, and so forth, to guide uh, this entire process that I just described. Okay, Earl. Thank you, Fred and, and Rodrigo. Now, on, on the tenants, by the way, bef before I get into these last two slides, before we open up for the, for the open forum and the Q&A, um, I just wanted to plug that some of my colleagues have a very, very interesting session tomorrow called um, Open Open SAC Tenant Perspectives. So what we did was uh, we actually ran a survey. We also did in-depth uh, face-to-face or over the phone interviews with different Open SAC tenants across our different uh, different clients uh, to get what they need, and and it's part of our migration practice that we have. Now, uh, if, uh, from my own perspective, from my personal perspective. We have a lot of work or potential work around legacy cloud to new cloud, from public cloud to open SAC cloud to some other internal cloud, including open SAC clouds to public cloud. And, 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 uh, and through, throughout all of this, what, what I see is that there's a big groundswell of support. Now, having, having said that, uh, we went through the approach. We went through, and I think by, by, it's, it's, by now it's clear to everybody that migration isn't a trivial matter. It isn't just a matter of shrinking and growing VMs and moving workloads across, but it's actually a fairly comprehensive systems integration approach that we need to, we need to think about. Of course, over time, what I'll get into, hopefully we, we solve this together over time. But I just wanted to point out that if you think about what's the most impossible and crazy cloud migration that you can possibly ever think of. So I actually have a, a, a colleague in the audience by the name of Palash. I won't single him out because he's too modest, but we're, we're, he's actually running a program in one of my clients before. We're, we're taking a mainframe system where maybe the last major code update was in 1994, PL1 and COBOL. We're modernizing it and with the end goal of, uh, uh, well, uh, maybe I shouldn't say how, how long exactly we planned it. It's not, it, it wasn't a short program. With the end goal of moving it into a cloud. So if, if you can consider moving a mainframe system last, majorly built in the early to mid 90s and move them into an open stack cloud. You know, it's, it, it's only our imagination that limits us. So from a visionary viewpoint, what we hope that together as a community we can work towards is that migration happens with zero downtime. There's a, lot, there's an, a very important temptation that we have to be careful about. You're there, you're presenting to your, to your, your, your business owners and they're saying, hey, Earl, we want to do a live migration. We can always try to do it. There are other ways to mask it. If it's a true cloud scaling app, a cloud native app, you, you, you can shift components off it so the end, end user result is different. But at the end of the day, for the virtual machines that you're touching, right now, it's very, very hard to have this no zero downtime. The other thing that we hope to, to get is migration happens at the push of a, of a button. We talked about the migration tool sets that we've been developing on our own with Ericsson, with Ericsson and other partners or from partners that, that we leverage. And in each case, in each case it's, a, it's, it's either something built from scratch or it's something where we use this, like, a, a tool like a cloud management platform and we have a lot of scripting on top of it. Right now, there's some degrees of automation that we can do, but I think we're not yet there where migration happens at the push of the button. And finally, when we talk about migration, it's not just a, a linear uh, uh, journey from legacy to cloud, but where we see the market heading is that migration will actually be a multi-directional movement across uh, from your legacy to OpenStack, OpenStack to feature, OpenStack, OpenStack to maybe a, a public cloud or maybe a public cloud back to OpenStack. So, my last slide is, is really a call to action, a call to action to the OpenStack community. Industrialized migration is needed. Uh, we're working with some of our partners in, in different projects that, that hopefully will, will at one point be accepted as part of the, 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 uh, the, the, the core. Industrial migration is needed for the, because, uh, because the, the rate of production adoption is just simply increasing. The rate of OpenStack adoption is, is increasing. 
And the only way to do this is for the community working on well-defined projects or well-defined work streams. And from an Ericsson perspective, uh, and, and I know my partners feel the same way, that, that we welcome, welcome you joining this effort. So with that, we talked about migration being a beast, so hopefully working together, we can tame this migration beast. So with that, we'd like to open the floor now to questions and answers, and, and Fred and Rodrigo here can help me out. Yep, and there's a, one microphone there and one microphone there, so feel free to ask away. Hi, <clears throat> my name's Aniket. Uh, I'm Aniket. cloud engineering at Box. Here's why the moving day analogy doesn't really resonate with me. In our production environment, we have hundreds of services mm -hmm. uh, managed by dozens of development teams. And when we think about a migration, it's usually a phased approach where we have services moving over to the cloud, then interacting with other services that are part of the legacy environment mm -hmm. as one larger ecosystem. That being one thing, the other thing is, when you think about a moving day analogy, what do you do with the millions of dollars of infrastructure that make up your legacy environment? Okay, that's a, uh, did you want to take it? Yeah, I'll, 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 let me attempt to do that. So um, uh, when we're talking about the migration of active tenants, at least in our experience, my experience, it, it, they, have to be, they can't be moved in a phased approach. <laughs> They're existing on one cloud, and they need to then be instantiated and come back into operation on the second cloud. So it's a very complex operational problem. If, if, if we didn't have that issue, we could live in this sort of bimodal environment for quite some time. Uh, so uh, my perspective is coming from, once again, I don't know if this is where you are coming from or not, but my perspective is in an operational environment, we simply don't have the time to go ahead and, and sort of do this uh, long, more drawn out, uh, and I, by the way, I would admit logical phased type approach, the time and the operational and production needs uh, just don't support that. So there are cases where we can group different applications that are fairly self-contained, and this becomes a unit of a phase. But what I'd also like to address you, because you raised, the second part of your question was really important about what to do with the infrastructure. So first, of course, we know that there's this big wave to, to move into an open compute type of infrastructure. Uh, within Ericsson, we also have our own solutions there, just like many, many other of your partners. Um, and in this moving to a new open, uh, I want to have a Google or Facebook-like data center, it, it's, a, it's a different question. But one of the strategies we have to try to preserve the existing investment you've made in, let's say, your, your, your storage devices, your, your blades, is that we try to do an, an, an in-zone or an in-data center implementation. So for example, we spare out some servers. This is where we deploy the new version of the OpenStack. And earlier on, I was making an illusion where we start to shrink VMs and shift VMs across. So as I move workloads over, I'm growing the new cloud within my data center and I'm shrinking the old cloud. So that's one, of, one strategy that we tried. But thanks for your so, question. So in that sense, it is a phased approach then. For certain applications, you will be doing it same day, but what you're essentially doing is from your entire ecosystem, you're shrinking some and growing oh, some. Oh, okay, definitely you're right. That, that actually, right. by the way, makes a lot of sense, and that is exactly what Earl was referring to. Uh, actually, a migration we've just been part of for the last nine months is doing exactly that. In the same set of zone or set of racks in a data center, literally shrinking the one cloud as we're migrating over. So when we're finished, instead of just deprecating the equipment, it actually now becomes the new right. cloud. So by no means are we suggesting a big bang approach. Anyway, there's a gentleman who had the question. Oh, maybe if you don't mind, sir, we'll just go over to this side and we'll switch back to you. No, maybe to quickly dovetail on the previous question. Uh, yes, what sir. proportion of these migrations do you see that happen within the local data center as opposed to public clouds? Huh. So, uh, in terms, in right now, the right now there's a lot of, and this one I don't have hard data. There's a lot of business interest into AWS, for example. But where I see a lot of uh, harder traction happening because it's like a quicker hit, is a movement from let's say a VMware VMware into OpenStack. Um, I, I think for AWS because there's a very AWS. Re requires, uh, re has a very specific governance model, very specific way that you, ha you have to operate and manage. 
So a lot of IT shops, they, they see a lot more um, control with, if they keep it in-house. But uh, I don't have hard data on this, but that's a very good question. Yes, sir. Uh, first, thank you for the presentation. One interesting thing you said was, if I heard you correctly, these days it's not a good idea to script everything, and it's much better to have a live person do it. Can you give me an example or two of things that can't be scripted these days, at least to not a reliable degree? Well, things that can be really automated is, is, for example, the creation of virtual machines in the right sequence, uh, respecting the affinity and anti-affinity rules, and, and, and the creation of virtual infrastructure like virtual routers and, and virtual whatever you need in the destination cloud. So some, some of the tenants that we, we migrated, they, they have like hundreds or even thousands of virtual machines. So, you, you can't uh, do those things manually, right? You cannot create everything in the destination cloud uh, using people. So you have to automate that. Also, the, the transferring all this data, you need to have something uh, automatically uh, doing that, right? You, you cannot have people clicking those things. And, and, and also the test part, after you migrate, you need to run some automated tests that is a very important part of the, the automation right there, right? You cannot have people executing test cases manually, depending on the size of the tenant. If you have a small tenant with three, four virtual machines, that may be possible, but most of the time you need to automate. But, and Libby, I think though, you asked for a specific example of, hey, something that couldn't be automated. So in our experience, like I said, what we found in the enterprise environment is, hey, we they may, uh, 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 our clients, our tenants, may be 90, 95%, uh, uh, I'll say cloud, cloudified and, 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 and all that, but there's still a lot of external networking. Uh, we've also, so that, that's one example that uh, can't be automated or, or is hard to automate. Another actually is, is, is as you're moving from a source to destination cloud, there are uh, potential conflicts in IP addresses. If you just move tenants over and, and they're virtual machines, and the new system, the new cloud system, starts assigning their IP addresses, there is the potential for conflicts there, and so those are best handled in a manual way. We haven't found a way to automate those yet. Thank you for your presentation. Um, you present the strategies for migration uh, or migrating business critical application to OpenStack. Um, I haven't heard anything about the security boundaries on how to mitigate the risk and what's the strategy to migrating these critical applications to OpenStack. I think that alone is a, it's a, a whole presentation, right? <laughs> uh, looking at the, the security point of view. But uh, uh, some of the, the, the things we were mentioning, they have to do with uh, uh, security. For example, uh, the certificates that you may need, and, and, and uh, again, mentioning the networking, if things are changing, right? And, and you need to, to, to make sure that all, all your networking or all your security part firewalls, if, they, if you're changing IP addresses, uh, are you going to reflect f on the new cloud, all, all the, the security aspects that you had in the legacy one? So uh, it's a very broad <laughs> subject, but, but there are several aspects that you need to take in consideration. Uh, th those are great points, Rod. And, and maybe the other part of your question is from a risk management perspective. Um, th this one, sometimes it can also, d one is there's the usual, I, I need the, the appropriate testing, I need the right rollback, I need somebody from the business owner to actually do the verification like what we talked about, but um, the, the risk here, and, and there's no, I, I can't think of any efficient way, is that sometimes the, the, the next level of resiliency will actually depend on the tenant itself. Like for example, um, the behavior of its load balancing capabilities. Uh, we, we, we've, had seen, we've had instances where, okay, I might have three machines. Uh, as I say, a broad example, I'll shift one first. Okay, then how does my load balancer behave so I know, okay, he's now over here, but he's down. Okay, he's now up. Now, uh, now I can load balance across three. Now it's time for machine number two. So once you start to go into discussions like that, it's almost as if you're doing it tenant by tenant. There's no one-size-fits approach that so far that we've seen. Yeah. I, 
I'll, I'll bring up one other thing too, and, and, and that is, as I mentioned early on, one of the key activities up front is, is a deep dive architectural assessment. So when we're, we're lifting and shifting over, nat naturally all of sort of the, the perimeter cloud security, that gets instantiated, but the architecture that the tenant with their firewalls and things like that, that they've actually set up within the boundaries of their zone, that needs to be very rigorously looked at from how you set yourself up in the source cloud and how is that going to work as we move you? Is it still gonna provide you the exact same level of security or not? So that's actually something we do and frankly, it's done by people like Rodrigo that have the technical ability to do it. Yeah, a similar aspect is, uh, do you remember that we mentioned the, the lab, right? The high fidelity lab. So you need to make sure that your new cloud, uh, all the architecture that you have there, it adheres to the CSO uh, organization and they will actually look at it at your lab and they will certify you uh, according to all the rules that they have. So. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you guys. You've been a wonderful audience. Uh, uh, we think this is a very important subject, and so feel free to reach out to me uh, or, or my colleagues here, but you can use me as a point of contact. Uh, I would like to hear from you, and uh, hopefully there's an area that we can generate momentum in the OpenStack community going forward, because it's going to be needed, it is needed, and uh, I think we're all up to the challenge. Thank you. Thank you.